Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer, and today we're here for yet another Civilization VI Leader Spotlight, where today we'll be taking a look at Jaya Varman of the Khmer. So Jaya Varman's first ability is known as Monasteries of the King, and it makes it so that his holy sites provide plus two food and plus one housing if placed adjacent to a river, and in addition to this, holy sites trigger a cultural bomb when completed. Uh, Monasteries of the King is, it's not really all that great, it's its really just not very impactful. Uh, the culture bomb part is, you're very rarely going to use that effectively. You can maybe get a few extra tiles, you know, maybe stealing them from one of your neighbors or something of the sort um, by using that culture bomb, but just overall culture bombs from completing districts I don't find to be too useful in Civ 6. Uh, plus two food is very nice in the early game, but that really, really falls off the later you get into the game. And plus one housing is kind of nice, but at the same time it's still, once again, it's not going to be all that impactful, so just overall, uh, Monasteries of the King is just, it, it's, it's not necessarily terrible, but it's just not overly impactful. Jive Armin's second ability is known as Grand Berets, and it makes it, so that, it makes it so that he receives plus three faith and plus one amenity from entertainment to each city that has an aqueduct constructed. Um, in addition to this, farms that are adjacent to an aqueduct will provide plus two food. Um, Grand Berets is a little bit better than Monasteries of the King, but still not all that great. Um, plus three f uh, faith from all of the cities with an aqueduct is, once again, it's just really not going to stack up to be too much, because if you think about that, even if you have like 10 cities all with aqueducts, that's only going to be 30 faith, and 30 faith is definitely nice, but uh, that's a lot of resources to put in to only get 30 faith out of it. Um, the plus one amenity is something that is very nice, though, just because of... Because of how much food you can get as Jaya Varman, you do have to watch out that you don't run into negative amenities um, because you have such high population. So getting plus one amenity from aqueducts is something that is definitely very nice. Um, farms providing plus two food if adjacent to an aqueduct, once again, that is something else that is that it, it, it can be actually very nice, uh, especially if you plan to have like maybe farm triangles right next to your aqueducts, or if you just surround each one of your aqueducts with, you know, f uh, five farms, then you can, uh, you like, you can indeed get quite a bit of food out of that and grow your cities to be quite large. Um, the only thing, as I've mentioned, is though, uh, you have to watch out for both housing and amenities that you don't run too close to the caps for those, because otherwise this food is not going to be doing you very much good. So overall, Grand Berets, um, one, it's, it's better than Monasteries of the King, but not by much. As far as Jai Varman's unique unit is concerned, we have the Dom Ray, which is a special unit that unlocks with military engineering. It's kind of like a, it's in a way a step between the Catapult and the Bombard. Um, I'm going to be comparing it to the, the, the Catapult, um, but it is pretty much equally comparable to the Bombard. Um, so it has a melee strength of 33, which is up plus 10 from the catapult, a bombard strength, so a range strength of 45, which is plus 10 from the catapult, a movement of 2, which is the same as the catapult, a production cost of 220, which is plus 100 from the catapult, and a maintenance cost of 3 gold per turn, which is up plus 1 from the catapult. It has some special abilities as well, so uh, for one, it exerts zone of control, um, so that's like, that's what melee units exert, that um, if somebody moves into the zone of control, then they have to uh, expend all their movement to move into that tile, and that's on uh, tiles that are adjacent to the unit. Uh, this also makes it a little bit easier to put cities under siege. Um, and the other special unit, uh, special ability that I don't have listed here is that Domre can indeed move and attack in the same turn um, without the need for the, the normal uh, promotion that you would need on a catapult to do that. So the Domre is... I think it's interesting because I, I like it as a unit. However, I'm not really sure... What I feel as though they should do in Civ 6 is make a unit that um, that is like not unique, just like within the the progression, such as like maybe a trebuchet or something like that that has very similar stats to the Domre. Maybe even give the Domre a little bit of a buff and have a trebuchet that has the same stats as the Domre because the Domre is pretty much a perfect middle ground between catapults and bombards. Um, because you know normally the, uh, there is no step between catapults and bombards. You go straight from cat catapults to bombards. Um, but the Dom Ray is 10, it's, it's 10 higher, uh, strength than the Catapult and 10 less strength than the Bombard. And, um, I, similar things happen with both production cost and maintenance cost. So what I really think that they should do is just for every single Civ, you know, just as a non-unique unit, they should add in a Trebuchet that maybe is around military engineering as well, that has pretty much these exact same, uh, stats, and then they should buff the Dom Ray a little bit, maybe give it, you know, like maybe three more melee strength and five more bombard strength, and then uh, just have that be uh, the Khmer's uh, unique unit. 
because overall the Dom Ray is actually fairly decent. Um, the one thing that does really suck with them though is that they upgrade into artillery, so if you build a bunch of these you can't upgrade them into bombards once you get the tech for that. Um, so that is something that is a little bit disappointing, but as, as siege units they do actually work quite well. Um, they are a little bit expensive though just because of their, their higher production cost and their higher maintenance cost, um, but they definitely do have the strength to back it up. So as a siege unit they actually are quite good. Moving on to Jai of Arma's unique building, we have the Prasat, which is a special building that replaces the temple. It provides plus 4 faith, 1 citizen slot, and 1 great profit point per turn, all of which are the exact same as the temple. It also has 2 relic slots, which is up plus 1 more from the temple, and all of the missionaries and apostles that are trained uh, in a city that has the Prasat receive the martyr promotion for free. So the Prasat is really, it's quite underwhelming, I don't think it's particularly good. Um, the, the main thing with the Prasat is just revolving around those relics, so what you can do is you can train a few missionaries and then send them off to die, and then since they have the Martyr Promotion, whenever they die in Theological Combat, you're going to receive a relic for free, and then you can uh, have those relics just be sitting in the one of the two slots that the Prasat has. So you can you can kind of use the Prasats to farm relics. Um, this is a little bit of a, it's a it's a bit of a bittersweet strategy though, just because whenever you have uh, religious units die in Theological Combat, there is a pretty big change in, uh, in in religious pressure that is around where the where the unit dies. So it is kind of counterproductive to have to just you know build units to have them die, especially if you're going for a religious victory. Just because you are gonna then have to purchase a bunch more missionaries and apostles to convert those cities back to your religion, or it's gonna be, or it's gonna take more missionaries and apostles to convert those cities to your religion in the first place. So that is a little bit counterproductive. You can use this um, in conjunction with the belief that triples the yield outputs of relics to get a decent amount of faith and a decent amount of tourism as well, provided that you're able to get enough of these. So with the Prasat, you are actually uh, able to go for a little bit of a, a cultural route with the Khmer, um, but overall my feelings towards it are kind of mixed. And now with all this in mind, it is time to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of Jai of Arman and the Khmer in Civilization VI. So for the first strength, uh, I think that they are really able to get quite high population in their cities, and they're just able to grow really fast. And that is something that is quite good about the Khmer. Um, they get a lot of food from their farms that are adjacent to aqueducts. You, you can quite easily get farms that are at least at plus 6 or plus 7 food, which is pretty high. Uh, that's, that's pretty high. Um, you're, uh, you're additionally going to be getting a little bit of food from your holy sites. Uh, that can be especially helpful in the early game because plus 2 food kind of falls off as you uh, get later into the game. But in the early game, that can get you uh, quite a decent amount of population growth and they will be providing plus one housing as well which is also quite necessary to growing um, so just overall as as a uh, sieve that's able to get decent population in their cities they are they are quite strong uh, the other big strength of the Khmer is that they can farm relics really easily. Uh, this just comes from, and, and pretty much entirely from the Prasat, uh, in that all of your missionaries and apostles are going to be gaining the martyr promotion for free. So anytime they die, they're going to be producing relics. And then since the Prasat also has an additional relic slot, you can hold quite a few more of them than you normally would be able to. So um, that is another big strength of the Khmer is just how many relics they can, uh, they can acquire throughout a game. As far as weaknesses though, the uh, the first one is a pretty big one, and that's the, the uh, Khmer really are lacking many impactful yield bonuses. They do get a lot of bonuses to food, and a little bit to faith, and a little bit to housing, but food and housing and just like a single amenity from aqueducts is, like alone is not going to help you win, win the game pretty much at all, just because... Growing your cities up is definitely nice uh, for working more tiles and doing stuff uh, like that, but really, you're not going to be able to get any additional yields such as science or culture or even really faith from having that high of a population. I mean, sure, you'll be getting a little bit of culture and a little bit of science, um, but it's not going to be all that great, honestly. And especially since the Khmer is, uh, is fairly religious-focused, being able to get high population means nothing towards that. So uh, that is just one of the biggest strengths of the Khmer is that, sure, they can get this high population, but it really doesn't do too much for them. Uh, the other really big weakness of the Khmer is that suiciding religious units is very counterproductive to a religious victory. So with that martyr, martyr ability, you know, you can use that to farm relics, which uh, then can provide you a little bit more faith per turn. Um, but you really don't want to generally suicide your missionaries just because then they're going to be... Uh, 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 making a big burst of a change in religious pressure to all cities within 10 tiles, uh, and that's going to be against your religion, so then you probably will have to spend some more missionaries and some more apostles to go convert those cities back, or it'll be a little bit more difficult to convert them in the first place. So that is really counterproductive to a uh, religious victory, so really you are going to have to choose between religion and culture just because... It is a little bit hard to go both if you're planning on using those relics for tourism, uh, just because of how many cities are probably going to get flipped um, whenever your uh, religious units die. 
And now it is time to give the Khmer their tier ranking. So if you're new to the series, what I do is I give each civilization a tier ranking in each of the four victory types, so domination, science, culture, and religion, and all of those rankings just kind of gauge the civilization's general proficiency at attaining either of the rankings. I give them an overall ranking as well, which takes into account such things such as their spawn bias and their versatility, and that ranking kind of gives you an idea of where they fall amongst the other civs in the game. All of our rankings go from S to F, with S being the highest and F being absolutely terrible. So Domination's up first, and I think Jai of Arma deserves a C in Domination. He just really doesn't have very much going for him in Domination. Uh, really, the only thing that he has is his unique unit, which is, uh, which is admittedly quite a good siege unit. But the only problem is, just one single good siege unit is not going to be enough to get you going for a Domination victory. Uh, the other thing that really hurts his siege unit is the fact that you have to wait quite a while to upgrade it. So if if you go for a push with uh, with with the dom right, you're gonna have to wait quite a bit before you're able to go for another push. So that is something that really sucks. Uh, the other thing is, if you're gonna go domination and you're gonna have a lot of cities, you really in general can't afford um, to grow your cities that that like that tall, just because you're gonna get absolutely crushed on amenities if you have a lot of big cities. Just because uh, having a lot of cities in general is pretty taxing on amenities. Having uh, very large cities is pretty taxing on amenities. So having a lot of large cities is incredibly taxing on amenities. And Jai of Armin isn't really to get really able to get all that many more amenities. Um, so it, that is something that uh, he runs into when he tries to go domination. Is that you really kind of have to forfeit that that growth ability if you're going to go domination as Jai of Armin. So overall, it kind of evens out, and he's he's fairly average, and I think he deserves a C. Science is up next, and once again, I think he deserves a C, pretty much just because he really just has no bonuses towards Science. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. He, he has no bonuses, therefore he is average, and I think he's quite deserving of a C. Uh, culture's up next, and I think Jai of Armin deserves a B in Culture, uh, if for no other reason than just his ability to farm relics. So, Jai of Armin is a sieve that I would probably advise going for the Religion and Culture play on, and normally I would not advise Religion and Culture just because it's, a, it's such a slow play style that is really hard to get going. Um, but with Jai of Armin, if you're able to get the, the belief that triples yields from relics, you can get quite a bit of tourism from relics. And if you're not planning on going for religious victory, it doesn't really matter if your religious units are suiciding, so you're able to just use uh, the Prasat to just farm a bunch of relics, and then you can use those to get quite a bit of tourism, because with that, with that belief, I believe that each one will provide 24 tourism. So if you're able to get, you know, like 10 or 12 relics or anything like that, that's that's a pretty significant impact on tourism. Um, other than that, though, he doesn't really have much going for him for culture, but uh, I think that is definitely a, a notable thing about Jai of Armin. It's just his ability to gain relics and use those relics for tourism. So for that reason, I think he deserves a B. Religion is up last, and once again, I think Jai of Armin deserves a B. Um, he is kind of sadly not really all that great in religion. Um, he is definitely above average just because of his... He's, he's quite incentivized to build holy sites, and he is able to get a little bit of extra faith from his, uh, from his aqueducts as well, but... Um, as I've said a lot of the time, really when it comes to a religious victory, all that you're looking for is straight up faith per turn, and Jai of Armin isn't able to get all that more um, than anybody else would, just because he doesn't really have any bonuses towards like constructing holy sites or towards the yields from the holy sites, and his unique temple doesn't provide any additional faith or anything of the sort. Um, but he is able to get a little bit more faith from the aqueduct. You can use the relics to get a little bit more faith per turn as well, um, but as I've mentioned, that is kind of counterproductive because you really don't want to lose religious pressure in a lot of cities by having your uh, religious units die, so that is something that kind of sucks. Um, but overall, I think he is still slightly above average with a religious victory, and I think he deserves a B. And now for his overall ranking, uh, I think the Jive Armor deserves a D. He's just, he's not a very good Civ. Um, he doesn't really have that many impactful bonuses. I mean, sure, he's able to grow a lot, but growing alone is not enough to make it so that you can win a game because um, it doesn't really help you with domination because really you don't want to grow too big whenever you're uh, playing for domination. It can help you with science a little bit, but you also need the other, you know, science yield bonuses or production bonuses or anything of the sort, and he's really lacking in that. Um, his culture game is fairly decent, but once again, it's kind of gimmicky with the, the ability to farm relics, and uh, gimmicky is never normally a good thing just because it's so specific and so limited to what you can do, um, and pretty much the same thing goes with uh, religion as well, that he really is not getting that many bonuses towards it. You can use the relic strategy again, but once again, it's very gimmicky, very limited. Um, it's it's a very linear playstyle. You really are just limited on options. Um, and overall, Jai of Harmon is just, he does not stand very well against some of the other civs in the game. Uh, so for that reason, I think he's, he's in, he's one of the lower civs in the game and quite deserving of the D ranking. 
So thank you everyone for watching, I've been the Saxy Gamer. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, if not, feel free to dislike. If you're looking for more Civilization 6 content, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.